So just if anybody doesn't know me, I'm Ryan Larkin. Um, I'm on Facebook a lot. Uh, if you follow anything on YouTube, I have a YouTube channel. It's Rocky Mountain Ryan or Rocky Mountain Prospector Ryan. I just shortened it recently because Rocky Mountain Prospector Ryan was a little too long-winded. So I thought Rocky Mountain Ryan <laughs> fit a little bit better. The good thing about my YouTube channel, I actually uh, go out around Utah pretty much exclusively and detect out here. I see a few of my friends out here in the uh, here that I talk to on Facebook quite a bit. And one of my buddies I hunt with on a pretty much daily or weekly basis. <laughs> we'll be seeing some of his finds here pretty soon. So how do you spell your last name? Larkin, L-A-R-K-I-N, just like the North Shore. Yeah. Don't think about that too, don't think about trying to limit the plural size. Yeah, yep. Well, perfect. So my presentation now tonight, now that I've gone over the hunt, um, so I'm going to talk about metal detecting. There's a lot of misconceptions about, about metal detecting, and a lot of people don't really understand the different types of metal detectors, what frequencies are good frequencies for one thing but not for another, and I'm going to kind of try to go through those. Um, I'm going to talk about coils, different types of coil sizes, um, shapes, things like that, and I'm going to go through one of the most important things to me, getting permissions. Um, it, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. It's one of the most important parts of this is research and permissions. Those, that's two huge things in metal detecting. If you want to be successful and find really good stuff, it comes down to those two things, research and permissions. But So I'm, I'm going to talk about metal detecting first. When, when do you guys think the first metal detector was actually made? 1940s. 1860 something. 1881, Alexander Graham Bell made the first one. For me, I always thought it was like maybe 40s, 50s, that seemed like that was the technology era. And I always thought it was in there, but Alexander Graham Bell came up with the first one in 1881. So they were trying to dig a bullet out of somebody. But I'm they sure. said it failed because the guy was laying on a bed and had springs and oh, it didn't work yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so this isn't a new technology. But the thing is, the, the older technology, you can have a machine you bought 30 years ago, and it's not going to react the same as machines now. The sensitivities are different, the coils are different, and they all interact differently. The first one I want to talk about is pulse induction. Um, does anybody have a pulse induction machine in here? They're not for two people. I, I had one up until last week and I just sold mine. But um, they're not very common. Pulse induction machines basically send out 100 pulses a second on average. And they last for about one millionth of a second. And they penetrate the ground really, really deep. And when they penetrate it, it actually gives a magnetic field to the um, metal in the ground, a really small metallic field. And when it reflects back up to the machine, the machine receives it and then transmits it to the audio to create a sound. Um, on most pulse induction machines, yours probably doesn't have a reading, like a, it doesn't have a numerical, this is gold, this is ferrous, no, this is silver. Yeah, it's mostly sound, and there's sometimes a lot of ferrous sound and a conductive sound. That's about all you get with the pulse induction. And it's because when you send those huge pulses down to the ground, the differences between a gold and a silver and an uh, iron nail are very, very minute. And so when those pulses come back up, it can't really read what the metal is. It's just reading there's metal on the ground. So you're going to dig in a ton. I was just out in Winnemucca, Nevada last weekend with a bunch of my buddies. And I didn't take a pulse induction machine on that. I, I lent mine out to one of my friends that ended up buying it. I used my gold bug, which is a VLF machine. And I was only digging holes this big, but the other guys with pulse induction were digging holes this big. Um, so the pulse induction on real teen, I mean, we're talking sub-gram, like 0.02 gram. I mean, they're, they're tiny little pieces of gold. And pulse induction, if you have the right coil and the right setup, they're going to find really small gold, and they're going to find really deep, big gold. Um, so they're, the pulse induction machines are basically made for big relics, caches, bigger, deeper targets, bigger, deeper targets and, and, and they're more specialized. It's not a, a machine you'd want to go out and just buy right off the bat. They're pretty expensive, and they're very limited in their, their scope of use. And like with mine, I had mine for two years, and I used it twice. just didn't make any sense for me to keep it. Especially now that I got the gold bug, and I'll talk about the VLFs here now. Um, VLFs, you, you've probably heard the terminology VLF, and a lot of people don't know what it is. It's very low frequency, or another name for it's induction balance. VLF, so there's there's a range in VLF, anywhere from one to a hundred, typically. 
and your machine will fall somewhere in that range. On the lower end of the range, you pick up more ferrous targets as that VL, or the, as the kilohertz goes down. So when you get a machine, they'll say it's a four kilohertz or a six kilohertz or an 18 kilohertz. That number, to a lot of people, you don't really know what the different numbers mean. I mean, they, it's just a number, who, who knows? Um, basically, the smaller the number, the harder time the uh, penetration, the harder the machine has penetrating ground. So what that means, if you have a four kilohertz or six kilohertz machine, your swing pattern has to be slow because you have to let all that energy from your coil beat into the ground and, and dig down deep. If you swing fast and you're in a hurry and you're moving, you're only gonna get an inch or two of depth. It's all gonna be surface stuff you're finding because your machine's not penetrating down. Now as the, my, my typical range that I like to stay in is anywhere from about 11 to 14. <coughs> Because I'm a coin guy. I love finding silver coins, I love finding copper coins, nickels, anything, anything old, I want to find it. And I found the sweet range for coins, for me at least, is anywhere from 11 to 14. The machines that run in that operating range do really, really well on the old coins that I'm looking for. Now, is that going to be as good for relics? Not really. There's 18 kilohertz machines, 19 kilohertz machines. Um, Garrett AT uh, Gold runs at that. There's, uh, there's a bunch of machines that run at that uh, kilohertz, but the, and actually the G2 Plus from Technetics runs at that. So any of the 19, 18, 19 kilohertz, they actually tout them a lot of times, like the new Goldbug Pro is a 19 kilohertz machine. Doesn't do as well as the Goldbug 2. This is a 71 kilohertz machine. So it's the highest end you can possibly get to. And what this does, the higher the kilohertz, the more you can find small, little, tiny gold or silver objects. Um, and with coil sizes, let me, let me talk about coil sizes a little bit. Um, there's, as you can see from this, that's a tiny little coil. I don't know if anybody in here has a coil on a machine that small. This is a six inch coil. I've got a five inch for my, this one is a 13 inch. And I have a five inch that goes on that same machine. And depending on the different situations that I'm in in the yard, I'll switch coils quite a bit. If I get close to the house and there's a ton of iron and trash, which the closer you get to a home, nails fall off, pieces of siding come out, people threw trash out of the house. So the trash progressively gets worse the closer to the house you get. And so I'll switch my coil out and go from a 13 inch to an 11 inch to a five inch, depending on where I'm hunting. And also, there's not one machine that's like the best machine. This machine runs multiple frequencies. My CTX 3030 runs 28 frequencies at one time. And the machine's reading all 28 of those coming back all the time. I can go through with this and pick out pretty much everything in the yard, I thought. Then I'll go back through with this and pick up a whole bunch more. Dane will follow me through. He'll pick up a bunch more with his E-Track. Every machine is it just has a little different sensitivity to certain things and your swing pattern might be off a little bit. So no machines like the definitive, like you gotta have this one machine to be a good detectorist. Spend as much money as you well, can. Well, your VLS hunt in a cone, right? It all, that all depends on the actual shape of the coil. And I was gonna talk about shape as well. So there's uh, three different basic shapes. There's the elliptical, which, Jerry, you wanna hold up your machine he just got tonight? That's an elliptical machine. Um, it's a double D coil. You see how it's longer, but really narrow. Then there's a round coil. This is actually a double D, but it's a round coil. And then you've got, and this is actually open web as well. So this is kind of both. So there's open web, round, and elliptical. Those are the three basic shapes you can get them in. The differences between the, the different ones. So the round coils are typically more sensitive. Like a lot of the whites machines you see out there have a round coil, really, really sensitive coils, but also they're a little more unstable. And that's probably why they're so sensitive is because they're pushing that limit on, on what you can uh, push with that coil. But with a, a circular coil, you always gotta think about it as it starts out whatever size the coil is and it goes down to a cone and gets smaller as it gets down to that point. So if you have your coil up here and there's coins at six inches, but your center of your coil is here, 
that cone will miss a coin, even though it's underneath the coil, because that cone shoots down at an angle like that. Where with the double D coil, and that's why I really like using bigger coils to start out in the yard with until I find trash. From this point to this point is my uh, hunting area. With these machines, you have a blade. Your blade that's actually detecting is only right in this little teeny strip right here. This doesn't detect. This doesn't detect. This is giving you your depth to this. So when you look at the bottom of that blade, it actually comes down in like a horseshoe shape. And so you have an actual blade of energy penetrating the ground. So it spreads it out longer, down further. And that's why I like the double D coils, just like, oh, what's his name? Rich? Rich was telling us about the double D coils, coils and why they're finding a whole bunch more gold. You get a, you don't have as wide of a pattern you're hitting and, and detecting, but if your swing pattern is good and you do overlapping passes with a double D, you're gonna pick up everything that a round coil would pick up and more because you're gonna get more actual space underground that you're actually detecting in. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? That's one of the things I had to learn over time. I have an old white coin master. They're great machines. So then that means I went to very slowly overpass everything because it's not the size of the head that goes down. The right cone, there. yeah. And so it all depends. When you walk into a yard and you start detecting, you first thing you're going to find is all the clad. You're going to find all the modern coins all over the surface and all the modern trash. So you almost have to hunt yards multiple times. You go through and pick out all the trash and hope to get some good coins the first time. And once you pick out all those coins, then you go back and you start over and then you crank up your sensitivity, you slink, swing slower. That's when you start to penetrate the ground. That's when you're going to start getting down through the, to the good stuff that's down below. Because the trash is going to interfere. <laughs> oh, it interferes a lot. And the older machines have a harder time with discrimination. The newer machines have better technology and, and processors are faster. Um, even the difference between my CTX is as expensive a machine as it is, I, I get nulling. If I have a really big iron target right next to a really good target, if I'm swinging too fast, I'll hit that iron target and it'll null and I miss that coin completely. So I've gone back through at different directions. I always do yards at 90s. I'll do it one direction and then I'll start the other direction and go this way because coins lay at different directions under the soil. And if you have a coin that's laying on the edge like this and you come over the top of it, you might miss it. You come over at this angle, there's more space that you're gonna actually hit on that coin this way than this way. So you'll find coins in different directions in the yard as well. Yeah, but, um, go through and do, do places, parks. You see people hunting parks all the time. People find great stuff. Dane, what did you find at the park down in Salt Lake last year? In a trashy park. 92 Barber Quarter. It was in Rose Park. 1892 Barber Quarter in Rose Park, of all the places. That place, people play soccer there every Sunday and throw every beer bottle cap on the ground. You try to detect that, all you're having is gnawing everywhere. He picked out a bar recorder in a park in the middle of the city. Some guys, uh, I actually, I had two CTXs. I don't know why I had two, but I had two CTXs and sold them to another guy. He actually took it up to Liberty Park. He's been pulling silvers out of Liberty Park. That's nuts. It's an old park. And to find silvers, he's found a couple of um, uh, Indian heads there, a V-nickel. I mean, he's, he's finding some good stuff. These, these parks in the middle of town that have been pounded for years by every metal detectorist that gets bored going out and trying to find new permissions. Um, that's, I'll lead right into that. So with the permissions, um, I see permissions and research as if you have a pie of how much time you spend metal detecting, metal detecting is probably 20 to 40 percent of what you do in this little pie the rest of it is driving around doing research on areas doing research on homes doing doing anything you can do to possibly find really really good locations that maybe other detectors haven't found one of the things that i think is critical in doing this is i have a smartphone and i have an app on it called zillow zillow is a real estate app 
Um, you can be sitting in front of a house, hit your Zillow app, find where you're at, zoom in on the house, and it will tell you the age of the home and the last time it was sold. That's huge. If you see a home that hasn't sold since the 50s, and it's a 1920 house, you can talk to the owner and say, hey, I, I've noticed you've lived here for a long time, your home's 1920s-ish home. I was just kind of giving range, not, I don't want them to think I'm creepy and know the exact age of their house. Most of the time. So I'm like, it's know. a 1920s-ish home. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, it's, it's a 1920s home. I'm like, so in your yard, um, I, I can find really great stuff. And part of the deal is just go to people's yards and, and try to, when you're asking permission, don't babble. Get to the point, introduce yourself, and introduce yourself in a way where you're like, I'm, so I'm Ryan Larkin. I have been going through this neighborhood. I've seen your house. I know it's about a 1920s home. Um, it looks like you've probably been here for a while. Has anybody ever mail detected your yard before? Most of them will say no. Um, I don't get yeses very often on metal detecting because I don't think a lot of people ask for permissions. Um, and so if they say no, then you say, hey, I've got a really good opportunity for you guys. I've got a lot of experiences at hobby I love to do. This is something I, I do just for fun. I don't make any money doing it. I, I do this just for the love of the history and the, I'm a coin collector. I'd love to metal detect your yard and give you guys back any of the relics I found to be tied to your home. Now, this is, this is optional. A lot of people don't like to give any of the stuff back to the homeowners. Me, personally, I'm a coin guy. I want to keep the coins. I want them to have anything that's tied to the home or to the history of the house or to themselves or maybe some of their ancestors that lived there before. So I, I started out with saying, I'll give you all the relics back that I find. If I find any rings, I'll give you the rings back. Um, if I find any, um, anything that can be tied to the home, like a, a plate that has a name on it or anything like that, I'll give you all that stuff back too. All I ask is that if I find any coins, I, I have a book with me, I'll go through and find out what each coin's worth in the book, and I'll pay you guys half of the value of the coins. That's my pitch. It might not work for everybody, and people might not want to give away as much as I give away, but I, I really do it because I, I just like it. I love the history of it. I love the thrill of finding stuff in the ground. And so I'm willing to give back to the people I'm hunting their yards just to be able to have the access to that yard. I really appreciate when people give me permission. And if I get a yes, the worst thing you can do is keep on talking and try to get more information out of them and try to keep working them. If you get a yes, just be very grateful. Thank you very much for allowing me to do this. I've got my gear in the car. That's another big key. Don't ever bring your gear with you up to the door and set your metal detector with you and then grab your, what you think is a small little shovel and sit your small little shovel over here because they see this sitting there with your metal detector with a quill that big, and all they can think is, that dude's gonna go out there and keep creating manholes in my yard. He's gonna be waist deep up and digging stuff out from like four feet down. That's the last thing you want. And I, I've thought about painting this uh, different color of brighter orange or something like that so I can find it when it's laying out there, but then I can't hide it as well. When I'm walking through yards, I always have my finger in my pocket usually, and I just hang this right next to my leg so people really can't see mm -hmm. that I have this with me. And if a homeowner comes out, I usually grab it and I usually choke up on it like this it so they can smack. see it looks like a little teeny hand shovel. It's not so dominant. Like, you don't want them to see this huge shovel sitting next to you. So I choke up on it a lot when I see them coming. <laughs> just try to hide it a little bit. Um, so the don'ts, I don't ever give out paperwork. I don't walk up to the door like a salesman and say, here, sign this. I want permission to your yard. Because that everybody sees paperwork and they just kind of back off. And I can, I can tell you, so I haven't had a beard up until about four months ago, three months ago. Grew a beard out. I've had a harder time getting permissions once I grew a beard than before I had a beard. Mm -hmm. And I swear it's just they see it. And they're just a little more standoffish because I, I don't know, I, I just sense it in them a little bit. And so I have to do a little more talking now than I used to have to before. So appearance is a big thing. When you walk through the door, don't walk up totally dirty head to toe, ripped up shirt, hat turned sideways. I mean, walk up there like you'd want, like you walk to your door and you saw somebody standing there asking for permission to walk around in your yard and dig holes in it. What would you want 
walking around in your yard. Nobody. Present me, pretty much. And there are a lot of people. I, I can say I'm probably about 70 to 80% yeses. So if I go out and ask for 10 houses, I'll get seven, maybe eight of them. So there, there are people that I come across them. I came across one last week. I had a bad experience last week I can tell you guys about. So I, last week I, I got permission to a 1918 home, just on a whim. I was gonna go out in the morning, get a new permission, all excited to go out and detect, stop by this house, get my Zillow app out, hit it, 1918 home. And it didn't show it had ever been sold. I'm like, ooh, this could be like an original family, just passed down to the kids and stuff. I'm like, this is, this is gonna be a gold mine. Huge front yard. I mean, the front yard is almost as big as this room is deep. I mean, it's enormous. It would have taken me hours and hours to do it. Go up to the house, 80 year old lady answers the door. I'm like, oh, this is great. An 80 year old lady, I can, I can usually talk to them really nice and, and if you're respectful and, and kind to them, they're, they're willing to talk to you. So I start talking to her and she gives me permission. Right after that, just get, yeah, sure, that'd be great. We, we've already detected it a couple of times. You'll never find anything out here. I'm like, perfect. I, I appreciate that because now I know all the clad's gone. <laughs> now I get down to good stuff. <laughs> And, and, and that's the thing, I, you, most people, if you find a yard that's been detected, a lot of times people don't know what they're doing and they just miss all the good things. So my first target, so let me tell you my first good target. I get out of my, I go back to my car, get my stuff on, throw my pouch on, get, grab my shovel, put my sh gloves on, turn my machine on, throw my headphones on, swing about six times, <coughs> and smoke and signal about nine inches deep, <coughs> 10 inches deep. I'm like, oh, it just sounds like butter. The number's not moving at all. I go out there and start digging it, pull it up, Indian head pipe, 1905, nine to 10 inches deep. Awesome first target. She sees me make that hit. She comes over. I couldn't shake her for two hours. <laughs> she stood literally right here next to me and followed me. Oh, is that another target right there? Is that, oh, I can see the machine's making some noise. And I have my headphones on. I'm like, oh, I can't even hear you. I'm swinging. And then she brings out a magnet on a stick that's like this wide. And she wants to pick up nails now. And she has her little magnet on a stick right next to me. And every time I swing over too close to her, it hits the magnet and it starts beeping. I'm like, seriously? So my, my whole day started to plummet now at this point. And I'm, this is, I, and you, the pressure of having a homeowner standing right next to you while you're trying to dig a plug, you want pressure, that's pressure. <laughs> now, a lot of people ask what I carry in my, in my bag with me. This is one of the things that I use this on every plug. So I just carry a bandana with me, and that's my ground cover. So when I dig a plug, I cut the outside areas of the plug, and I'll tell you about how, how to dig a plug first. But then I lay this out right next to where my plug's at. So when I pull the plug up, the plug goes on top. If I have to dig anywhere down inside the hole, all that dirt comes up and is placed on top of this ground cover. You do that because you don't want to be disrespectful to their yards. If I had somebody digging my yard and you know, I love my house, I don't want to come back out and see piles of dirt laying all over my yard and big plugs cut that look bad and they're like two inches too high and weren't stomped down in right and stuff. So I always put it on one of these and I always leave the plug attached to the ground. I never cut an entire circle out of a plug. I cut and leave two to three inches on one side completely attached. So when I pull that plug out, it's a hinge and it just hinges out. That way that plug is still physically attached to the ground and it still has lifelines running through that. Then after I'm done, I just take this, dump all the dirt back in, pull it back up and stuff it right back in my pouch and, and I'm off and going. Um, now, people ask me what I have in my pouch a lot of times, and this is, I haven't unpacked this from my last trip out with the old lady. So I carry my, my ground cover with me. I got my gloves. I, I dig with gloves. A lot of people don't like gloves. I like them because I cut my fingers all the time. On hand slaw and glass and everything else. Get a nice thicker, you can even get those um, ones that have like a rubbery finish on them. They're really thin, so you still have tactile feel underground. They wear out pretty fast. I like these, they're mechanics gloves. Um, they last, I've never had a pair of gloves last me a year, and these have lasted me a year and a half now. Awesome. They're a little thicker, a little more clumsy underground, but they work really, really well. Um, everybody asks me why I have a pink spray bottle, so I don't lose it. It's the only reason I have a pink spray bottle. Steel. It's, it, <laughs> yeah. I, I went to the dollar store, I'm like, oh, that's the brightest one, I'm taking it. Because I lay these things down, and as you can see, it's dirty. 
has them down there spraying off coins like that, muds all over it. And if I had a, a lightly colored or a brown colored uh, thing, I'd put it down and you might not find it. I might lose it. So I try to get a lot of bright colored stuff. I always carry, this is just a fly box, um, one of my, my fly fishing stuff. I carry this to put my good coins in. I put some uh, nice padded cotton balls in here. So when I find a really good coin that I don't want to clean and feel, I know it might be maybe a key date, and if not a key date, just a, a real good keeper. I'll put it in here, even with dirt on it, close it, goes back in my pouch. That way it's not rattling around with everything. You don't stick it in your pocket and your keys, and your keys are hitting it and scratching it. It's protected in there. Now, my wheat pennies, they go right in the front pouch. Anything that I don't really care about or that I know is not a key date, I just put it right in the front pouch and all my coins at the end of the day are right there. Um, if you guys are going to get into metal detecting, I hope you save enough money to buy a pin pointer. Honestly, I went out two times without a pin pointer in the very beginning, and after about 30 minutes fidgeting in one 10 inch plug trying to find a target, with my metal detector going over the top of it, and I grab a handful of soil and run my metal detector over the top of that and put that down. That was the worst plug I'd probably ever dug in my life. Because by the time I was done, it was like shreds of stuff laying all over the ground. Well, I found the target, and it took me 20 minutes, but I, but I got the target. I'm like, there's got to be a better way. Somebody told me about a pinpointer. It's a game changer and a world changer. If I go out and, my, and I get to a spot, I go to turn my my pinpointer on and it's dead, I put my metal detector back in the car, I drive to the store, I don't care how far it is, I'm buying a new battery for it. I don't even start a yard if I don't have a metal or a pinpointer now. So what kind of pinpointer do you like for that? So, okay, this one's a Mine Lab Pro Finder. It's a good one, it's not my favorite. My new favorite one is the Garrett Carrot, the orange one, it's the Garrett Pro Pointer AT. It's an awesome, it actually has better depth than the Pro Finder, but okay, so the Pro Finder, there's pros and cons to every machine and every pinpointer out there. So this one, the most sensitive part on this is the very tip. So if the coin is in a plug on the side and you start moving down, it'll go and as it gets past the tip, it'll die back again. Where if the Garrett, the whole thing is sensitive, mm -hmm. up and down. So I don't care if you stick it in there and it's ringing up, it could be anywhere in this much of an area. Okay. So the Garrett AT, AT Pro Pointer is my favorite because it has better depth, plain and simple. Um, and that's pretty much all I carry. I, I, I'm pretty lax. Everybody asks me what kind of shovel. This is a Predator shovel. Um, you don't see it very often, it's a Predator Raptor. I, Used to use a leche or leche, 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 however you say it. Mm -hmm. It's a weird looking foreign name. They're a little thinner. Um, they're kind of nice. They're really straight on the sides. So when you're down in a plug and you want to cut around the edges, they're really straight and nice. This is more of a hook. I use this 90% of the time. I use this 10% of the time. And I only use this once I've already got the plug cut and out. And now I'm down there trying to scrape around the edges to get down around where I think the coin's at, get all the stuff back up. And it's got a big white area on it to get everything up and on top. Now there's a lot of stuff to go and I, I'm, I'm getting short on time. So I'm gonna kind of jump to the end of the whole presentation. Um, so a lot of people are like, oh. the old lady. <laughs> <laughs> so the old lady, I didn't finish that, did I? Okay, I, I gotta <laughs> tell you this story. So my best buddy in the world followed me around for two hours, two hours. What 80 year old lady wants to walk in her yard for two hours and look in little holes in the ground? This one did. We made the deal. I'm going to give you all the relics back. I want to keep the coins. I'm going to pay you half of whatever I find for the coins. That sounds like a great deal. Perfect. I'll go with that. We get to the end. I'm taking pictures of these coins. I have six Wheaties and the, and the Indian head penny. Ran out of time. I had to go to the soccer game with Coach. So I, I take pictures of them, and she goes, Well, can I see those? I'm like, Sure. I, Dump them in her, her hand, cleaning up and putting my gloves away, put my phone away and stuff. And she goes, ah, you know what? My daughter's a coin collector. I want to keep these and give them to her. And I'm like, that wasn't the deal. I'm going to pay you half for these coins. 
and I gave you all the relicky type things back already. Yeah, well, I'll give you two bucks and I'll keep them. <laughs> so I came out with a $2,000 metal detector for two hours and all the experience I have and had to have you follow me around all day for two dollars. I don't want two dollars. <laughs> like I came out here to have fun and, and find coins. But yeah, so that was the end of the story. And then she goes, oh, but if you ever want to come back and detect, here's my name and number and call me and come back anytime. I'm like, yeah, that's never going to happen. <laughs> Popped my car, drove home, called my buddy on the way home, and was like, you would never believe what just happened to me. He got bamboozled by an 80-year-old. <laughs> yeah, that was that was great. I know a guy that carries fertilizer and you know, puts it in the plug. So you know what, a lot of people will do that. Um, no, so I didn't even talk about plugs, how to dig a good plug. So I, I, my brother-in-law owns a sod farm. I went to a sod yeah, firm with him and asked yeah, him, if I'm going to cut into your sod, yeah, what is the best yeah, way to cut the sod? See if gonna do it he basically right. said, okay. what you want to do, you need to good. get down yeah, about we'll six inches. So we'll you need to cut a straight yeah, line yeah, along yeah, the sod. Yeah, if you ever buy sod, you'll notice the edge of it is completely yeah. straight. The reason that is, all the that, roots right, grow right, straight right, down. Right, so if you're cutting straight down, you're not slicing off all those roots. If you get down six inches, most roots don't get to six inches, and if they do, you've got enough root up above for it to re-grow uh, back in. So I'll go around and cut straight lines all the way around the side of the plug, <laughs> dig it down as far as I can under that plug I just caught, and then pull the whole thing up and out with those straight walls. So when you pull that plug out, it's a beautiful round plug that's tall, and it just sits there. And you don't ever want to decimate that plug. You want to leave that plug intact as much as possible. And that's where the pinpointer comes in. You can swing that pinpointer around the outside of the plug and it'll ring off on one side or the other. I'll usually make one poke. If it doesn't ring off on the outsides, I'll poke my pinpointer right down the middle of the plug as far as I can get it down. That way it's pushing the roots out, but it's not breaking the whole thing apart. If it's not in there, then I go inside. The, actually, I usually start inside the hole and go around the inside of the hole and then down at the base to see if it's still down in there. The new metal detectors will kind of tell you how deep the target is. So if I dig a seven inch plug, and I know that the coin's about seven inches, I know it's right basically at the bottom of the hole. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the best way that I've found to uh, do plugs. I actually made a video on cutting plugs where I dug in my own yard in August and watered about half as much as I was going to water just to see, like if I just peel off the top layer of grass, what happens? If I peel off, two inches of grass, what happens with some topsoil? If I take four inches, six inches, what does best? A little poke hole where I tear it open and just try to pull something out. And the best one I had was when I did a five, six inch plug diameter, six inches deep. Pulled the whole thing out, put it back in, stomped it back in flat. That did the best. I, you couldn't even see a hint of that after about two weeks. Now, a lot of people ask me what I do with uh, all my coin finds and relic finds and stuff like that. I really don't sell any of them. I, I, I like to keep them. One of my buddies brought a lot of his stuff. There's nothing better than having a little box. And when you take it, silver sounds so much better than plaid. <laughs> this is a whole pile of silvers that Dane, the group of mine lab had on back here found. Last year. And that's last just year. last year. <laughs> it's a lot of silver coins. And we hunted a lot. <laughs> yeah, you can find stuff like that in the state sales all the time. And, and actually, a lot of the coin shops around, you can find really cheap old coins like that. And you can, if you're a coin collector, you can go find pretty cheap coins at uh, places like that. And make, make estate sales, you can find them that are actually really, really good. Um, really good quality and really good mint marks and stuff like that that are key dates which when you dig in a yard a lot of times you'll find key dates it's all coins that range anywhere from 10 cents to two dollars pretty much all the time i showed you something outside when you were walking in i did he showed me and this is a gold club let me put in a free plug for fisher so this is a fisher gold bug too this is as far as a vlf machine goes this is the best vlf machine on the market for small gold you wouldn't think a small coil would be better than a big big coil. You'd think bigger, better gold. Well, it really doesn't happen that way. 
a small coil is more sensitive. So the smaller the coil, the smaller the gold it will find on the end. If I had the 10 inch coil on this, I probably could find stuff in the half gram range or more at five inches. With this, at five inches, I can find a sub gram, 0.02 gram of nugget. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've... He's got a, he's got a little team. I, I have found gold less than a tenth of a gram with a gold bug two, two or three inches down. So this weighs two tenths of a gram. It's pretty big because it's pretty flat, but about three inches away. That's you're wearing headphones. Head you're going to hear that really well. In here, it's hard because the speaker. That's yeah. and if you ever can wear your headphones. Wear all headphones. Yeah, headphones. Yeah, headphones. Is a game changer. You don't Same need your batteries too. Yeah. Fresh batteries. Yeah. Same yeah. on your batteries. Yeah. Fresh oh, batteries. Yeah. Wear headphones. Yeah, but this, this machine does really, really well on a really tiny gold. No competition. Oh, um, so what about, you know, like, the tiny gold and the tiny deep gold? Um, so that's, the, that's, that's one of the things that you're, you're losing. So when you look at that arc underground, the arc gets smaller the smaller the coil is. So maybe six inches deep, you'll find gold too. You're not going to find it at 10, 12, 20 inches like she guy machines would. So there's gives and takes on both arcs. Um, so people ask me what I do with my coins. Last year I had a guy up in Alaska. He, his boy was getting into metal detecting, getting into coin hunting and stuff like that. He really wanted to get a good group of coins to give to his kid. And he wanted something he could tie. He didn't just want to go buy stuff in the coin store because it has no meaning. So I made a bunch of videos and was able to, the guy was able to show his son the videos of all the coins I was finding and get him pumped up about all these coins. He gave me, kind of cool, this is an Inuit hat. It's a spotted seal hat for every coin I found last year. Hmm. It was a good trade. It's something I would have never bought for myself. Mm -hmm. And through my connections on Facebook, I, I met this guy, became friends with him, and it was worth it to him to give up a really cool artifact from up in Alaska to give his kid some of the coins and get his kid really involved and not want to sit in front of a TV and watch cartoons or play his video games. He wanted to get him out of the house. So through my metal detecting and me making my videos on my YouTube channel, he was able to get his kid pumped up about it. And when he moved back from Alaska, now they go out and metal detect all the time. And that got him into it, was the fact that now he's got books and books of coins that were found. And then you can go back to my YouTube channel and go, Ooh, that's when he found that coin right there. <laughs> So you can tie it back to something, which is kind of cool. And I know I've gone way over my time, so do we have any more questions? One question. Sure. On my white coin master, I was given a big head. Yep. Is there any advantage to that thing? A lot more depth. A lot more depth. A lot more depth. Okay. Yeah. The bigger head, the problem with the big head is if you're in a really trashy yard, mm -hmm. if you have trash in that blade of uh, energy well, going to the ground, Okay, oh, it's a round one. Yeah. So if you have multiple targets in mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you might not hear the good targets. Yeah. So the bigger the coil, the more depth, but also a ton more signals in your head. So you got to get used to listening for the good signals and phasing out. Like I don't really ever watch my, my screen very much. I hunt by audio. I have four tones that are always going. And I just listen for tones. When I hear a good tone, I'll stop and then I'll move back. Then I'll start watching my screen to see if the screen is telling me what I'm hearing. Then I usually will move at different angles and see if it, it changes and stuff like that. Well, but I don't have yeah, a it's, it's it's definitely an obsession. And if you guys get into it, I just I, Jerry just got a brand new machine from me tonight. That machine he has actually isn't even on the market yet. That it's a Fisher Patriot. Not even on the market yet. He got the first one in the U.S. right there. Doesn't sound legal. <laughs> Just don't tell people a fisher. <laughs> what? Where's the best place? <laughs> so there's there's some good online places. Um, there's Chuck's detectors here in Salt Lake. Um, he's really knowledgeable. I know he's a white distributor. Really good guy. He's been doing it for so many years. If you have a like, metal detecting, he can tell you everything about it. Um, if you don't mind talking to people out of state, there's a guy, Jerry's Detectors in Boise, really knowledgeable guy. I bought my first detector from him, and I was traveling to Boise. He actually hand-delivered it to my hotel room, and it was on the bed of my room when I got there that night. 
because he knew I was going out looking for gold the next morning, and I, he wasn't going to be up at 12 o'clock at night when I got to the hotel. So he delivered it. He's a really good guy. Treasure Mountain Detectors in Alabama. Keith Jones there is awesome. The guy has a wealth of knowledge, and he will work killer deals for you, especially if you drop mining. <laughs> Chuck says 1200 East Vine Street. Yep. yep. He's a great guy. It's a little hard to find. Don't get frustrated if you look for Chuck's spot. It's downstairs from a pharmacy and kind of around a corner and back and around and through. And it's like, it's hard to find. And he doesn't have a really good sign out front. It's a lot of equipment from him. Yeah. He, he's a great guy. I mean, he's a big prospector. He comes to a lot of the stuff here. You'll see Chuck. It's not Chuck. It's, it's uh, John Ursus. John Ursus. John Ursus. But it's Chuck's detectors. What other uh, for small gold uh, kind of stuff that we might get exposed to? Uh, what other machines? The best machine I've seen for small gold, if you want a PI machine, is the SD or Mine Lab SDC twenty three hundred. So some people in here might know Doctor Tones from uh, YouTube. His name is Brandon Neese from up in Boise. One of the top detectors in the nation. I went out with him out to Winnemucca last week and he found a piece of gold. It was SDC 2300. It's a super sensitive machine. It's going to cost you though. This machine is about 7800 bucks. This is seven eight hundred dollars The SDC is going to run you in the 2500 2800 range. So you're going to pay for it. Other ones of the uh, low frequency. VLFs. VLF. So, Anything that operates in the 19 kilohertz range, the Gold Bug Pro, the AT Gold, any of those run in the 19 kilohertz range, they'll do okay with gold. They're more, I see those more as relic machines than gold machines, but they'll do both. Sorry, I took up so much time. One more question. Oh, sure. It's kind of an awesome one. Sure. I have a uh, different 1225, and it's just what do you know what kilohertz that one runs at? I don't, I don't know that machine actually. Pardon me? Do you know what kilohertz that runs at? They don't make it anymore. They don't make it. Okay. They quit making yeah. it. But it, that's why they I'm tried to upgrade the technology. There's there's some old analog machines. This is an analog machine, but the older analog machines, a lot of them are more sensitive than new machines. But they're harder to read, and the sensitivities and the ground balancings are different. And so there's trade-offs from the old machines versus the new machines. But yeah, there's there's some old machines that are just awesome. Is Gold Bug 2 ground balance yep. itself, or do you have to? No, do it's no, a push button ground balance, and you have to pump it. Yeah. This one is an actual knob. So as you're pumping it, you got to have one hand here and one hand on this, and you have to manually move this around to find where your ground balance is. I bought my first Gold Bug 2 in 96. They're awesome. They're really awesome. They're wild. They're a great that's all I got for you. Thanks. Now, how do I get a hold of you? I can give you my number. No.